Hey, John here. I was just surfing around the internet looking for articles and stuff about how composite video or what we call NTSC video, also called a CVBS, uh, how that works, how the signals operate. So we can talk about what we can expect to get out of the VDP board on the Z80 Retro that's based using the TMS9118 over here. Now, Analog Devices has these technical articles. I hope they don't mind me showing it on my channel. I bought a lot of products from them over the years. I built video switching systems and stuff using their cross point switch chips, which worked marvelously, okay? Now, this particular report, I think, is right to the point. It's pretty good. It's really on the nose of what I think we need to discuss to make sure that we all understand what to expect when we're playing around with our VDP. Now, the article goes on to explain a few things. and What I want you to get out of this is that a video image is made up of what we call horizontal scan lines that are composed and comprised into fields that are then paired together so two fields becomes what's called a frame. And one frame is like a flip book movie. That is the single, what you can think of as a single image of a movie that's flipping past on the, uh, on the display. Now there's some subtleties involved in there, but what I've said is essentially true. Um, it's certainly as far as the VDP board goes on the Z80 Retro. That's exactly how the thing works. Now, what I want to talk about are the voltages that are involved in expressing the video image on the screen. And they, do, they give you a couple of diagrams in here that I think illustrate the point very nicely. So let's look at these things. They discuss on this image here the fact that this horizontal line that cuts through this image is one of, as we'll see, 525 total that start at the top and then end up down at the bottom. And each one of them, from left to right, describes whether, among other things, whether the image is supposed to be bright during this portion of the screen or dark, like it is in this portion of the screen. It explain it, it 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 sends this information in analog form over the course of time. So time t zero, when the image represents this part of the far left edge of the screen is comes before time t1 where it starts describing over here and so on so we can actually look at these traces on an oscilloscope over the course of time and see what an image looks like as it's being described from left to right and if you look at this one line right here what we have is white followed by black followed by white followed by gray followed by white followed by less gray and more white so what you have is white is a high voltage like this, maximum voltage, what they call 100 IRE, which is a standard name that they use in video, representing the maximum amplitude from zero, as we'll see this is called a sync tip down here, all the way up to maximum uh, uh, voltage here, which is described as 100 IRE. Okay, so white at 100 IRE describes the image right here. Black, it has to go down to the voltage that represents black, which is low, but not as low as what we'll see is called a sync tip, okay? The sync tips are unique. Black is at 7.5 IRE, we say, all right? Then it goes back up to white, and we're describing here. It goes back down a little bit, but not to black because it's gray right here, right? And then it goes back up to white, and then it goes back to lighter gray, back to white, and then we have what's called the, the, uh, the horizontal blanking interval or the sync uh, part of the signal. We'll look more closely at that in a minute. The point of this is to let the screen know it's time to go back over here and start the next line as it proceeds down the screen, okay? Down here, they talk about interlaced and progressive video. NTSC in America, composite video, broadcast TV, standard def TV, whatever you want to call it, uses interlaced video. And what they do as I said, you get the field one and field two. This is the odd field and the even field. And what they do is draw half of the picture in each one of these fields. The field rate is 60 hertz. 
the frame rate is then 30 hertz. Now, the reason they do this is because if they send a picture out at 30 hertz, the phosphor on the CRT screens from the 1950s, right? This is all pretty old. When they first did this, would flicker a lot and it would bother your eyes. But if they updated it at 60 hertz, it looks okay. Now, the problem is, if you send a whole picture 60 times a second, you need to send twice as much data per time unit. So what they really wanted to do is send only 30 frames a second. After all, you go to the movies, and a movie's 24. So they don't really need to broadcast 60 whole frames a second. What they wanted to do is keep the TV monitor lit up. So, and granted, yeah, modern gaming systems, you got to have your 120 and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, okay, fine, it's a whole other story. But broadcast TV wasn't about modern day gaming with high end, you know, $10,000 GPUs, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, this is just to get the job done. So they needed 60 hertz to keep the phosphor on the screen from flickering too much. And they um, only had enough broadcast bandwidth to send 30 frames per second so they only send half a frame that's the whole point so one field the odd field would be line number one and then number three five seven and so on until you get to the bottom of the screen the last one on the odd field is a half of a line but that's beside the point right now there's subtleties involved in this but let's not worry about it the point is you send half of the lines 60 times a second and the odd lines go then the even lines go and the half a line for an even field starts up here and so that would be numbers like you know two uh four six eight and so on or maybe it's zero two i don't remember how they count them that's beside the point we're looking at 60 fields per second and each field is interlaced we say either the odd lines or the even lines, okay? They have another diagram down here that says if you're dealing with progressive, you just simply send all the lines in order without playing games with, with interlacing and stuff like that. But of course, like I said, if you were to do this on a regular TV, you'd need to send uh, the data often enough to keep the screen. If it's Remember, these were phosphor CRTs, and they would, they would glow, and they were like light bulbs, and they would flicker, so they had to be done to tune that just right. We didn't have all the fancy digital stuff like we have today. Now, this document goes in to talk about a few other things and how to deal with resolution and so on and how they rate all that. That's not critical, but it's interesting. Read, go back and have a look-see. Then they have a chart down here where they say, here's various formats and how they work. This is getting a little bit dated, of course, because they only have HD TV defined as you know 1080 and so on by 1920, which is your standard DAF 1080 video which you might call today 2k because 4k is derived from the fact that that number right there is doubled as would be this on a 4k screen okay over here is your composite tv all right so you have approximately 480 useful visible lines out of 525 total okay and that's in your vertical uh, resolution. So there's 400 or 525 total actual line times that are broadcast out. Then in the horizontal resolution, which is where things get interesting, and that's the whole reason we need to talk about this, what you're dealing with is an effective resolution, really, because remember that the, 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 the signal goes up in voltage and then down in voltage and up and down over the course of time to represent the brightness of this horizontal line. The idea of a pixel doesn't really exist in NTSC analog TV. It's just this continuous gradation of gray and black and gray and white that happens from left to right on your screen okay now we like to speak in terms of pixels because it's easier for us to draw a digital image that way and you can effectively convert between the two by arguing that well if the if the signal goes up and there's white here and then it goes down and there's black and you divide it up into a bunch of pieces each of those pieces yeah it could be a pixel but here's where it gets interesting. How fast can you move the signal from, you know, dark 
you know, gray or something like that down here. If we go and back up here and look at this one again, how fast can I go down here, represent black, and then go back up to represent white or some other brightness? That'll dictate how small of a horizontal dot I can put on a screen. Because it's really going to end up being kind of just a bunch of smeared uh, color or, or, or brightness gradations from left to right, okay? In the vertical dimension, it's plain, cut, simple, and clear because we're literally striking individual lines. These are absolutely distinct. So if you look really closely at an oldie-timey TV, you see these perfect layers of lines like a stack of pancakes at your local greasy spoon okay but you don't see lines going like this dividing all your horizontal things into dots because of this idea that it's a continuous uh, uh curve of brightness getting bright and dark and so on over the course of time from left to right okay but you effectively due to the way things are modulated the quality of the circuits and the rate at which you can change the brightness you effectively have at most you know between 320 and 650 would be could be pixels per line so you effectively got your 640 by 480 in the best sense in the best case okay they also give you some other information about how how often does it draw a line across the screen. It does it 15.734 thousand times a second. Uh, what else we got? The vertical frame rate is on the order of 30. Now you can read the article and learn about why we end up with some weird 2997. But that's beside the point for us. Highest frequency megahertz is 4.2. Now that's going to dictate how fast you can go from black to white to black to white and things like that. So hiding in this number here is what is going to limit your ability to draw individual dots across the screen. In addition to, which we'll see in a minute, <laughs> how color works, all right, which is really causes a problem for us, as we'll see in a minute. Different encodings. Uh, that you might be familiar with. You have some numbers down here. So right on here at 4.2 for composite video, PAL does better at 5.5, but not earth shattering, like high def, which gives you 25 or even 40 megahertz for XGA, which is your 1024 by 768. You're operating way up here. So this is 10 times better than uh, broadcast TV. And you'd look at a 1024 by 768 screen today and go, you know, so think about that for a minute, right? Oh, my gosh. So this thing can update at 60 hertz, okay? High def, what are we looking at? Uh, that's the horizontal rate, uh, vertical rate, rather. You got your 60 to 80 hertz. You got your 30 to 60 hertz over here. And um, most high def that you see nowadays is progressive, and it's working at uh, 30 or 60 hertz. Anyway, the point is, standard definition NTSC video is pretty low quality, all right, relative to what we're used to today. Now we get to the interesting part. With all that in mind, what does each one of those horizontal scan lines look like? Well, here's a diagram of the signal over the course of time and what the voltage will do between the sync tip here and white. So if you drew a line on the screen, one single horizontal scan line, what do we got here? A composite video waveform of one line across the screen. It would look like this. You've got your sync tip. This is the color burst. We'll look down here in a minute. And then it goes uh, into what we'll call the active scan area or the active video area, which they uh, call it here. And then you have the sync tip for the next line. So this here is a repeat of this diagram over here. A little bit of terminology, okay? As you go into this sync tip, this horizontal blanking period, and they call it horizontal blanking because when it's over here, it's drawing, you know, uh, brightness on the screen from left to right. It shuts the gun off, as we say, the electron gun, which fires electrons at the phosphor that lights it up on the screen. It blanks it so that when the gun, when when the uh, analog electronics charges up these 
you know, charged plates and inductive coils that are used to bend the, the what we call the electron gun and aim the electrons. You have a, a finite amount of time it takes you to change the, the voltage and the tr current flows through those analog de uh, devices that are inside the CRT, which it uses to re-aim the gun back over to the left and down a little bit. That takes time, so that it gives you 10 uh, microseconds with the gun off to re-aim to the next line. So that's what the time is that's used here. And this is indicated by this super duper low volt spike that we can look at more closely here called the sink tip. So you have the front porch is what they call the time after the active video that leads into the sink tip, okay? You then have the sink tip or the horizontal or e-trace time or whatever. There's different names for a lot of uh, uh, people, what, what they call the sync tips, but I'm going to call it a sync tip. Uh, you then have what is collectively oftentimes referred to as the back porch, all right? But they break it down to a breezeway, color burst, and then the back porch technically is this part over here, all right, which is this right there. Okay, before it goes back up to the various voltages that describe the bright and dark uh, regions of your screen across that scan line. All right, now you have this color burst. Well, the color burst is a sine wave, yet they drew it in a weird way. Okay, now what the color burst does is on an even field or an odd field, it changes the phase of this signal, which is a simple sine wave running at 3.8 megahertz, it flips the phase by 180 degrees. Now, nah, there's a reason for it, I forgot why. And if you go and look at the technical details of the VDP chip on the z and retro board, and you look at the history uh, of the people have posted that worked on that chip over the years, one of the guys said they didn't even realize that the color burst was supposed to shift 180 degrees on the even and odd field, so they didn't do that. So technically, the VDP may not really work as best as it could, all right? But... Be careful, you know, I say, if you're looking at this on your oscilloscope, uh, be aware of the fact that VDP doesn't follow all the rules absolutely perfectly. And most TVs don't care anyway. In fact, I don't think any of them really do. I remember at one time in life, I understood why they did that, but I can't recall right now. So I'm going to let that go. I'll leave you comments below. I'm welcome to be reminded why the heck they chose to do that. Now, what is the point of all this? Well, the color burst does two things. One, it lets the TV know that there's color information in the MDAR active video scan line, all right? Otherwise, what happens is the TV, if it doesn't see a color burst signal over here, the electronics changes a little bit, and it can present a far superior uh, uh, image on the screen if it knows in advance that the scan line is only going to be black and white. It doesn't have to do all the extra processing to figure out if it's color or not. And this is where we're going and what we need to understand a little bit more about when it comes to things like the TI-9118 VDP when it's emitting its composite video. Now, how then does color work? When you have a color burst here, if this voltage down here means black and this one means white, where does the color come from? Well, that gets us to back to the name, the composite video. This is one signal that is the composite of multiple things. It has sync information, it has color information, and it has brightness in there. They refer to the brightness as the luma, the luminosity, right? And the color is the chroma or the chromacity of the signal. So if we scroll down here and it says, where color is concerned, and this is kind of a misleading presentation, but read the text and it'll make more sense. What happens is you've got your sync tip, you've got your color burst, which is your 3.8 some odd megahertz sine wave that looks like this, all right? Then you've got your active scan, and the higher the amplitude, the brighter the image. Then you've got these colors here. And this is a, a nice drawing, but 
Uh, they mix two things together here. There's not any really, <laughs> certainly there's no color in a, uh, <laughs> in a graph of a voltage that's going up and down, okay? So what this represents in the style that they've presented it here is that there's a sine wave here who's centered on this line here. So if this was a, a grayscale image, a black and white TV image, what you would see is you're being black as you come out of the, uh, the, the, the back porch here, up to white, and a little bit gray, and grayer, darker, darker, darker gray. You get to the front porch over here for the next uh, uh, sync tip, all right? Now, what's the color thing about it, and what is the amplitude of this thing supposed to represent? Well, you take the same exact 3.8 megahertz signal here, and you impose it on your grayscale image here. So you just put a sine wave on there. And it is the amplitude of this sine wave imposed atop of this otherwise grayscale voltage. It is that amplitude that represents how saturated the color is. And by saturation, they mean uh, how far away from gray does it get? If it's 100% maximum amplitude, it means it's, it's as yellow as it can possibly be. As the amplitude shrinks down, the color becomes less and less saturated. It becomes closer to just gray, only slightly yellow. Or, you know, it moves towards white or gray or black, depending on the amplitude of the, uh, the signal without this superimposed sine wave on it, okay? Now, how do we get the color? If we zoom in a little bit here, uh, what we've got here is, if this is the 3.8 megahertz signal, during the period of time where the color burst is being sent to the screen, all right, and you change the phase of that signal. What happens is the amount that you change this phase, like drawn right now, it looks like this is at the peak and it's falling, and they put this vertical reference line here. Uh, this one here, uh, relative to the one above, this one is slightly out of phase, it has arrived a little bit later. So that's what this difference here is supposed to show. This signal goes from here up and it's coming around at 3.8 megahertz. This one here is also exactly the same frequency, 3.8 megahertz, but it goes from zero and goes up a little bit later than the reference does in the color burst signal. So is the number of degrees of phase difference here or the time period of delay that creates a phase difference here that determines which color on the color wheel you're going to see during that period of time that is described by this part of the active scan line. All right? So the amplitude of the, the chroma signal, we say, during this period of time says how saturated the color is going to be. And it's the phase difference between this signal here and the one there, which are again at the same frequency, that determines what color it's going to be. So what are the pros and cons of this whole thing? Well, the obvious pro is, if you study the history of this whole thing, you can add color to the broadcast system that was in place in North America when they first introduced this and make it backward compatible with the black and white TVs. A black and white TV simply shows this as black and white. And in the worst case scenario, what happens is, as this thing squiggles up and down, what you get is what we call dot crawl, teeny little gray dots in the picture that your eye doesn't really pick up very well, okay? Also, you can put a simple low pass filter, which a lot of TVs have and had back then, that filters out all frequencies above three point say. 3.7 megahertz, and all these things simply disappear, and all you're left then is your grayscale, okay? Really easy, backward compatible. That's really the number one reason they did this. The number two reason they did this this way is because, you know, for composite video in general, this is true in black and white as well, 
you have one sing- single carrier or one single cable wire that has everything on it. So you don't have to plug in, you know, your red, green, and blue signals. You don't have a funky connector with a bunch of pins and things like that. The average consumer, I mean, give me a break. Most of them don't can't can't figure anything out. They're still trying to figure out how to plug in a USB connector. You know, it doesn't go in, flip it over. How hard is that, people? <laughs> ah, but I think if you're watching my channel, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We've all been there. And that by that I mean trying to explain anything to anyone. It's it's a nightmare if things get ugly. Single cable, single carrier, backward compatible, huge wins. Okay. What are the cons? All right. And this is uh what we need to be very sensitive to. The con here is that if you're moving around the luma part of your signal you're getting bright dark bright dark and you don't even want to worry about color at all maybe you want to generate a black and white signal you want black followed by white followed by black followed by white well if you do black white black white black white at a rate that approaches 3.8 megahertz a TV will confuse that with the chroma subcarrier. And you won't get black followed by white followed by black followed by white. What you'll get is some color or morass of colors. Depending on the frequency, if it's close to but not equal to the, the 3.8 exactly phase locked to the color burst, then what happens is you get a rainbow of colors from left to right, even though you might only want little black dots next to little white ones and so on. Which is why, up in this table in here, we talk about the maximum horizontal resolution. How many, how many dots per line? How quickly can you go from you know, low volt to high volt without screwing up all the color information? Well, you can't do it more than something in this range. You just can't do it, okay? And even if you do obey by the rules, most uh, screens screw things up. Let's do a quick Google search and see some examples. If we go to images, I think we'll just see a whole bunch of them. Now they're going to see a lot of information about uh, images and, and how the color works, right? The luma, the chroma, just like I'm saying here. A bunch more pictures of the same kind of stuff and some theory as to why it is. And then you're going to see examples, composite artifact colors. Let's see what Wikipedia has to say about this. Oh, yeah. You see what's going on here? This is, look, you end up with orange. This is a perfect example. If you're going black, white, black, white, black, white, and this happens at a very specific frequency, okay? And this is an example right off the TRS-80 Coco. What your screen will show is orange with the 5,000 messed up edges around the ends of the 5,000. And this is because the, the, the screen misinterprets the voltage going up and down here as part of the chroma subcarrier. And when it goes up and down, up and down, up and down, and then stops, this part of the signal right here is it getting confused as to whether or not it still should be drawing color or is it now stable at black. So it takes a little while to change its mind and it become black. Then it sees it going again. And it goes, oh, uh, was I black or, oh, okay, no, I'm supposed to be orange again. So now it goes orange and it happens over and over and over. This is something that we need to be sensitive to when we're working with NTSC video on the likes of the TI-9118 VDP with composite video. Because we're going to get all these artifacts around the edges of our images. I wanted everybody to know this before we go into this whole thing, because the choice of colors and how often you change from black to white or you know bright to dark uh, on your screen is going to affect the image a lot. We're not used to this today. 
you're if you're born after uh, say 1995 you know high def tv would have come into the world before you were the age of 10 and you're just not used to this anymore okay so when we talk about retro games this is the hallmark of retro games on ntsc now, if you're on uh, if a SCART system or something like that, or you're using component video or high def or whatever, we don't have to worry about this anymore because that's done in a different way. It doesn't have this composite uh, signal with everything all at once and <laughs> being sent to the screen and saying, okay, Mr. Screen, guess what I meant by this change in voltage here, right? So with all this in mind, we're now prepared to be able to generate video and understand what happens if we're going to try and just expose, you know, two saturated colors right next to them while the screen is trying to figure out, am I still, you know, magenta uh, or am I red or did I go from magenta to black or white or am I going up and down and it should just be black and white or is this supposed to be a color? Uh, that sort of thing. When you design uh, programs, you design images that are going to be rendered in composite video, in NTSC. You need to sometimes take this into account and be careful. And the short of it is, uh, if you're going to make a, you know, if you're going to stake a claim to drawing something on the screen, you might want to have more than one of what we would think of as a pixel or what is a pixel if you're going to program something like a VDP or any graphics, any raster graphics bitmap screen. You probably don't want to vary every single pixel across the line in any great way, okay? You might want to put a couple of the same color followed by a couple of the same color and uh, not change the brightness drastically all the time, or you're going to end up with one of these type of situations. On the other hand, how quaint. This is very retro. This is what all screens look like back in the day, and sometimes this becomes part of the image, right? They're little. Sometimes you see a rainbow effect of different colors around uh, the edges of things as well. It's just part of what happens when you use this encoding. So, welcome to 1979. <laughs> Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.